Welcome to Destination History, where we tackle interesting and fascinating places and take a stroll through the history behind them. This episode, we're going to be taking a trip to Northern Ireland and bask in the wonder of one of their natural formations that has given rise to quite the folklore tale. Come along with me as we discover not just the story, but also the science behind these fascinating formations. Join me as we take a look at today's destination, the Giant's Causeway. So you like listening to the podcast. You're learning a lot, but it's not enough. You need more information, specifically on your favourite destinations. Well, you might just be in luck. For the last couple of episodes, and for all of those coming up, I will be featuring books on the topics of the destinations that we visit in the podcast. You can purchase these amazing books through this wonderful company called bookshop.org. They exclusively support small, independent bookshops, both in the US and in the UK. For now, I'm sure their plans for world domination are well underway. Each of the books that I recommend will be available for purchase through bookshop.org. Just click on the link on the Destination History website and you're already there. If, like the rest of the world, you don't live in the US or the UK, then don't fear. You may not be able to purchase the books through bookshop.org just yet, but if you drop by your local independent bookstore, I guarantee they'll be able to help you out. Well, what more is there to say but happy listening and happy reading? If you've been to Northern Ireland or already live there, there's bound to be a point where you heard of the Giant's Causeway. And that's because it's one of the coolest natural formations there is. John Sutter from CNN describes it like this. A golf course green canyon wall slopes into a set of volcanic rock formations that are completely surreal. Near-perfect hexagon tubes are stacked next to each other like puzzle pieces. The formation is made up of roughly 40,000 basalt columns that each have five, six or seven sides and they literally come up from the sea and it runs for about six kilometres along the coast. The Giant's Causeway was first officially discovered in 1692. It was when a bloke named William King decided to take a holiday to the north coast of Northern Ireland. At the time, his job title was the Anglican Bishop of Derry, but in the not-too-distant future, he would be known as the Archbishop of Dublin. Even though the bishop is acknowledged as discovering the place, like most natural formations, the locals had known about the place for pretty much forever. As with most things back in the 17th century, discoveries were usually attributed to the first one who published about the thing, and in this case, the first written reference about the Giant's Causeway can be found in a letter from a Sir Richard Bulkley to a Dr Lister at Trinity College in Dublin. The letter was written in 1693 and was even published in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society London, which coincidentally is the world's first and longest-running scientific journal. But, like a typical mansplainer, oddly enough, Bulkley had never visited the Giant's Causeway, so his whole description about the Causeway was based entirely on what the bishop had seen when he went for his visit. The next year, in 1694, there was a second article about the Giant's Causeway, this time by a founding member of the Dublin Society, a Mr Thomas Molyneux. Like Bulkley, he had never visited the Causeway and so just spoke of the information that came before him as fact. The drawing that accompanied the article in Philosophical Transaction was highly stylized and not entirely accurate. So Molly knew went looking for an artist that could draw something a touch more realistic, and he managed to commission an artist named Edwin Sandys. Sandys went on to make some pretty great drawings, with his subsequent engravings appearing in Philosophical Transactions in 1697. But the Giant's Causeway really took off in the mind of tourists when some pretty awesome watercolours were done by artist Susanna Drury in 1739 and 1740. She was even awarded £25 in art premiums for the paintings 
and they actually made their way across the European continent. In 1743, the paintings were even engraved. And it wasn't until 1765, in volume 12 of Encyclopédie, the French encyclopedia, that an article was published about the giant's causeway using the engravings made of Drury's paintings. And again, Drury's engravings were used in a follow-up article in 1768. The captions on the engravings were written by a French geologist, Nicolas de Marest, who came to the conclusion that the columns were volcanic in origin. De Marest was correct in his assumption and is actually credited with suggesting the causeway's origin. And all this from an engraving of a painting, not even a photo, and of course, once again, he himself had never visited the causeway. In 1788, one of the first guidebooks published proved to be very popular. The Complete Irish Traveller detailed the excitement about so many places in Ireland it had to be split into two volumes. And you guessed it, it contained an exciting description of the Giant's Causeway. Guidebooks proved to be incredibly popular and really took off in the 1830s and 40s, with the Giant's Causeway featuring in practically every single one, each with images and stories about the formations. The 1832 article in the Dublin Penny Journal hints at the Causeway's popularity. Our readers, perhaps, may be apt, in the words of an Irish tourist, to exclaim when they see our woodcut, this causeway that every tourist has trampled on, that has been sketched, etched and lithographed, described by antiquarians, geologists and poets, system builders and bookmakers, and why not? Why show us and tell us what everybody knows? Naturalists, part of naturalist clubs, would make trips to the causeway, excited to be gathering their own information about the formations and developing their knowledge with what was already known. This was part of a geological movement that saw more and more prints of the causeway appear in more and more journals. At the same time, photography was just starting to take off, and so it was that photos were more starting to make their way into those journals and prove so popular that by the end of the century, it was reliable that they would be in the journal or guidebook right alongside the engraving, sketches and paintings. Tourism was a real draw card for the naturalists and geologists, as well as those aspiring. The causeway became so popular that a tramway had to be introduced to help with the numbers. In the 1960s, the National Trust took charge of the site, and in 1986, UNESCO declared the site to be a World Heritage Site, with the Department of the Environment of North Ireland marking the area a National Nature Reserve. All of this pretty much ensured that the causeway and surrounds were protected from modernisation that would ruin the landscape. Because the formation isn't the only important thing, the beauty is also in the cliffs, seashores, marshes and grasslands that are home to some 50 species of birds as well as to more than 200 species of plants. An amazing place, the causeway is known to have been a tourist attraction for the last 300 years, perhaps more for the locals, and is known as a national symbol of Northern Ireland. The Giant's Causeway is one of the greatest natural wonders in the UK, and by its geographical definition, it is a natural formation of basalt columns that were formed roughly 60 million years ago as the direct result of a gigantic volcanic eruption in the area. And if we have a look through the article in the Dublin Penny Journal again, we find some interesting information on how the causeway looks. The greater part of the columns are of a pentagon figure, but so closely compacted together that though the pillars are perfectly distinct, the very water which falls upon them will scarcely penetrate them. There are some of the pillars which have six, seven, and a few have eight sides. It's believed that the irregular columns that form the causeway were formed when molten rock was forced through the fissures of the earth, forming a lava plateau. Basically, the interesting and one would think unnatural shapes that the columns appear in are due to the lava cooling so quickly that when the lava hardened, it contracted. Very simply, the number of sides depends on how quick the lava cooled. 
There was a lot of lava and therefore a lot of columns. Let's head back to our favourite journal article to find out just how many. In the entire causeway, it is computed there are from 30,000 to 40,000 pillars, the tallest measuring about 33 feet. That 33 feet equates to about 10 to 12 metres high, which I don't have to tell you is a long way up or down, depending on where you're standing. Because the causeway disappears quite literally into the sea, erosion has definitely been a factor over the centuries, or dare I say, millennia. But in this case, erosion hasn't been so much of a nuisance, but has created more attractions for tourists. The erosion of the ocean on the rocks has created some interesting formations. Let's have another look at our favourite article again. Among other wonders, there is also the giant's well, the giant's chair, the giant's bagpipes, the giant's theatre and the giant's organ. About 50 to 60 million years ago, there was so much volcanic activity going on that the basalt that has been chilling below the surface was turned to liquid by the heat of the Earth's core. And this molten basalt rose up like some kind of biblical event, and practically a lava lake was formed. And it was when this lake cooled that the columns were formed. As we already know, the different shapes of the columns depended on the speed of the cooling, and since the amount of lava was lake-sized, there's no way it could have all cooled at the same temperature or the same rate, giving us columns across this plateau that look mysteriously like stairs or stepping stones. But despite its magnificence, the Giant's Causeway is far from being a one-time wonder. Similar natural formations have been seen right around the world, I'll bet with perhaps a more interesting name, as the Devil's Post Pile in the US comes to mind. But this formation is smaller, meaning that the cooling was faster. While the basics of the science behind the columns was understood, it wasn't until recently that geologists could figure out the whole story of why the magma reacts the way it does when cooling. It was a professor of volcanology at the University of Liverpool, Jan Lavalli, who pondered, This is a question that has fascinated the world of geology for a very long time. We've been wanting to know whether the temperature of the lava that causes the fractures was hot, warm or cold. Lavalli and his team were able to recreate the exact conditions in the lab when they used basalt cores drilled from the volcano Yeyefjakliokul in Iceland. The cores were cut to about 20 centimetres long and were then heated up to over 1,000 degrees Celsius, which is when they started to soften. The samples were then clamped and cooled to see when they would snap. It was found that the magna would break when it reached between 840 and 890 degrees Celsius, proving the process and temperature through which the giant's causeway was formed all those millions of years ago. This amazing breakthrough has been epitomised when Eleanor Kilo from the National Trust said, It's no wonder this place is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, because beyond the mind-boggling beauty, the causeway is our portal into Earth's most ancient past. If we take a step back though, the causeway can look like a massive series of stepping stones, and it's this that has caused imaginations to kick into gear, because who would think the causeway was made for giants to walk across oceans? And now we head into legend territory, a legend that tells of giants moving back and forth from Ireland and Scotland. This is nature at its most primal, carving the land into made formations that send the imagination into overdrive. No wonder dreamy and fantastical myths surround it. While science is in the know about how the columns are formed, the Irish had another explanation for the cause of the causeway, and it went a little something like this. It was common knowledge that there were similar formations on the Isle of Staff in Scotland. It's known as Fingal's Cave and is very similar to what is seen at the Giant's Causeway. The legend says that Finn McCool, an Irish giant, and a Scottish giant that went by Ben and Donna, weren't really the best of friends. Versions differ on how the challenge came about, but what's important is that the two giants were committed to a challenge to fight each other. So Finn, to make this easy and because he's a good guy, 
decided to build the giant's causeway between the two islands so that the giants could get to each other so they could have this supposedly legendary fight. There are a couple versions about what happened. One says that Finn overslept, and when he didn't show in Scotland, Ben and Donna went looking for him. His quick-thinking wife, Una, put a blanket over him so that he looked like a massive baby. Another says that Finn was awake the entire time, and when he saw how much bigger Ben and Donna was than himself, he freaked out and got his wife to disguise him as a baby. Regardless of how it came about, Finn is under a blanket pretending to be a baby. And when Ben and Donna gets to Scotland and sees this baby that is as big as a full-grown giant, he assumes that his father, Finn, must be absolutely gigantic. Ben and Donna is so terrified that he races home, destroying the causeway behind him. There's another version that says that Una, the fast-thinking wife, painted a rock so that it looked like a stake. While she gave the stake-painted rock to Ben and Donna and a real stake to Finn, who was acting as a baby. And so Ben and Donna, who supposedly had never eaten a steak before in his life, saw how easily the baby was eating a giant-sized steak while he was properly struggling. So naturally he freaked out and ran the whole way home, also destroying the causeway as he went. Even though this is the main myth that you will hear surrounding the giant's causeway when you go to visit, it's not the only one. There are in fact a couple of them. One of the folklore tales says that instead of being a giant, Finn McCool was actually a legendary hero, kind of like Hercules. He has superpowers, special abilities, and was reportedly a member of the Fomorians. The Fomorians were giant beings who were basically like Greek gods. They had supernatural origins and specific magic abilities. They were also very popular in pre-Christian Irish mythology. Disappointingly, the stories and legends about the Fomorians have been lost to time. If you drop by the Giant's Causeway anywhere after July in 2012, you'll find a new visitor centre. In 2005, Hennigan Peng Architects won a competition to design a visitor centre that would feature exhibition spaces, a cafe, toilets and the all-important gift shop. From the visitor centre, tourists visiting the causeway only have to walk less than a kilometre to get to a designated tourist area of the natural formations. Once you're down on the causeway, you can actually walk along the giant stepping stones. But be careful because if you look close enough on the columns closer to the water, you will see dark stripes on the rocks. This is a type of plant known as tar lichen. And it's incredibly slippery, so unless you want to end up all the way in Scotland yourself, watch where you step. Having said that, the causeway is pretty great for rock pools. There's limpets, sea anemones, and even cushion starfish. The visitor centre, rock pools, and of course the causeway attract 300,000 visitors each year. That's not as much as some of the destinations we've covered on this podcast, but for some pretty cool rock shapes, It's pretty impressive. If you had fun and feel as if you learned something, give us a subscribe and a review. And even if you didn't learn anything or even like us, give that button a click anyway. You can find us by searching Destination History in all your major social media platforms, podcast providers, and Google. When you subscribe, you'll get an update for any new episodes coming your way so you won't miss out on any exciting destination historical content. As always, all links spoken about, images, resources used, and way more can be found on our website at destinationhistorypod.com. And if you have a building, place, or area of significance that you would like to learn more about, shoot through an email or a message, and I'll see if I can cover it in its very own episode here on Destination History. See you next episode.